Welcome. Thank you all so very much for joining us here at the Akakik Foundation and our presentation of Sisters Forever. The Akakik Foundation stewards the sacred homeland of the Piscataway people, and we endeavor to tell authentic histories and the truth about those histories in all of our historical presentations. The presentation you are about to see is titled Sisters Forever, which is part one of the Sharper Family series. Part two will be shown on August 6th, and we hope that you will all join us for that. We ask that you sit back, relax, and enjoy Sisters Forever. This program is brought to you by the Akakik Foundation at Piscataway Park. Is it that you are here? Kate, I am free. You are free? Yes, my master taught me how to make shoes and he sold them and gave me some of the money. I saved up till I was able to pay for my freedom. Oh, 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 to such a blessing. My baby sister, free, like my Tom. Tom? Yes. Oh, Marianne, I am married. You're married? Yes, and to a free man. About a year after I was brought here, Tom came to the land looking for work and, and Master paid him a small wage. He allowed us to be married and we even have a son named Jack. Though he was sold away some years back, Tom has had to find work somewhere else, but he grows his own tobacco. And we are hoping that by selling that tobacco, we can save the money so that Jack can get his freedom. Well, I actually met a free man named Tom and he told me about he, that he has a son named Jack, that he's a leather apprentice. Maybe it's the same one. Most certainly it is. Jack made these jumps for me. Tom was able to see him and, and he told him that he wanted me to know that he was safe. Wearing them makes me feel like he is close to my heart. Well, I heard that his master may be coming down soon. He, he's kinder than most, and he may let Jack visit. Are you to be certain? 
I might get to see my baby boy. It's been five years since he was sold off. I'm sure he is a man now. Oh, to such a blessing and to know that you, that you earn money from making shoes. Mama always said you were so quick with the needle. <laughs> Do you remember how cross she would get when she would get pricked after you would leave them out? Mama, is she? She's well. Oh, tis a blessing. Oh, my prayers have been answered. Oh, my Mary Ann, my sweet, sweet baby sister. Oh, you must be so hungry from your, from your many travels. Come, let us go inside. I shall fix you something to eat. We hope you enjoyed that. But yes, that was Sisters Forever. I would also like to say that this presentation is being recorded and next week, all of you who have registered will receive a copy of this entire presentation via email. Now, about our family. Kate Sharper, we know for a fact, was an actual enslaved woman in this area. According to documentation that we have at the Akakik Foundation, we know that Kate Sharper actually arrived at the farm in 1751 at the age of eight. That would have had her be born in 1743. In 1770, the year that we portray, Kate Sharper would have been 27 years old. Now, we have altered the timeline a little because with time frame that Kate would have been born and the time frame that we portray, Jack would not be able to be almost an adult. So we have altered the timeline to allow for the actor portrayals that we have for these characters. Kate Sharper would have been married for 11 years, having been married at the age of 16 to Tom Sharper. We believe that he was a free man in the area, but because we don't have documentation of every aspect of Kate Sharper's life, we have crafted a story about her being married to a free man because we know that it was indeed possible. We do know that her son's last name was Sharper and by her not being owned by any families with the last name Sharper, that leads us to believe that she was married. The family that actually owned Kate Sharper has asked us not to share their names and out of respect for them, we do not. But we do know that in 1765, a smallpox epidemic broke out in Piscataway. The family that owned Kate also purchased another little slave boy. So Kate Sharper, according to documentation, had a son actually named John and Jack was another little boy that had been purchased by the family. Unfortunately, we have found out that he passed away in the smallpox epidemic in 1765. Since I have been here at the Akakik Foundation, we have always portrayed Kate Sharper as being married to a man named Tom Sharper and them having a son named Jack. Perhaps the decision to name her son in the presentation was to be in honor of the little slave, enslaved boy named Jack who passed away from the epidemic. The character of Marianne Soul is a fictional character. As I said, we do not know much about Kate Sharper's life. We don't know where she was from prior to being brought to this land as part of the dowry. So we do not know if she had any siblings on record or not but we wanted to show that there were free black people 
in the 1700s. There was a fairly large free community of Blacks in the Baltimore County area, which is where we portrayed that Marianne could have potentially met Tom. If you were free during this time period, you weren't allowed to stay in one particular location for very long. You had to do a lot of traveling. You had to keep moving. And so it's very possible that two strangers could have met in a free community and got to talking and unknowingly be connected to the same person. And we wanted to show how sometimes those instances in life can change the course of your life forever. As I stated before, on August 6th, we will have part two of the Sharper Family Series presentation, the reunion of Kate and Jack, where you will be able to see the conclusion where Kate is possibly reunited with her son. Spoiler alert, she is. And in that Zoom presentation that we have prepared, you will have the opportunity to meet the other young actor who does portray Jack Sharper and He's played by my very own son, Deldridge. So we hope that you will make your plans to join us for that on August 6th. I want to take the time now to talk about some of the experiences that the enslaved had to endure. What I'm going to share with you comes from Plantation Row, Slave Cabin Cooking, The Roots of Soul Food, by Patricia B. Mitchell. Any of the references that I make during this presentation will be included in a email that will be sent to you all next week. As I stated, this video will be also included in that email, along with additional resources to find other slave narratives at your local library or in the Library of Congress or even online. Now, Plantation Row, Slave Cabin Cooking, it's a very thin book, and it is a cookbook, so there are many wonderful recipes in it. Uh, but the book also mentions slavery from the 1600s to 1860. They mention regions from the Northeast colonies all the way to the Deep South, and the slave narratives do not specify specific locations, although there are some points where specific years may be mentioned. In the mid 1700s, approximately 50,000 blacks were enslaved in the North and about 500,000 in the South. Slave labor was very important to the plantation economy. On big non-mechanized plantations where cotton, sugar cane, rice, or tobacco were grown, many hands were necessary. Here's one former slave's account. I couldn't rightly say how many acres was in the plantation, Alec Pope recollected. I knowed my master had two plantations with fine houses on them. He just had droves and droves of slaves. And when they got scattered over the fields, they looked like blackbirds, there were so many. So that will give you an idea of how many enslaved people could have been on one plantation alone. And for one planter to have two plantations is enough to give you pause. <clears throat> Field hands generally worked Monday through Saturday to about noon, getting the rest of Saturday and Sunday off. A wake up call was sounded early when a bugle, conch shell, or a ram's horn was blown. Men had to be in the fields by sunrise, and women went out around 8 a.m. They worked until sundown, and by the time they ate and finished their other chores, it was 10 p.m. before they made it to bed. Commented one former slave, we worked from sea to Kent. Slaves could be hired out to other, in to other individuals or enterprises. One example was a request for black laborers to work on the construction of the Rappahannock River Canal. They paid five to eight dollars a month for 50 to 60 men, fed them as much bread, meat, fish, and molasses as they could eat, and even offered them spirits. The money went to the slaveholder. 
Although some of the owners allowed the slaves to keep a portion of the hired money as a work incentive. And because of that type of practice where the slave owners were paid for their slaves work, some kept all of the money to themselves and then some did share it with the slaves, with the enslaved people. And that is where we took from to create the story of Mary Ann, where she was making shoes that her master was selling to other people. And the profit that he received from that, he would give her a small portion. And many, many slaves who had that opportunity would save their money to purchase either their freedom or to purchase the freedom of a family member. There were a few ways where someone who was enslaved could gain their freedom. They could be freed by their owners upon their death called manumission. They could earn their own money or be or receive a portion of money that their owners received for goods and services that they provided or they could run away. Now, in many cases, to be born free, you would have to be born of a free mother. So in the case of Kate Sharper with Tom Sharper, with Kate being enslaved and Tom being free, any children that they have would belong to Kate, would belong to the master because Kate was enslaved. So it would be similar to owning a cow and another farmer has a bull, any calves from that union would belong to the farmer who owned the cow. On the opposite, if a white woman had a child with a black indentured servant or a black enslaved man, those children would be born free. So those are the ways where someone would either be born into freedom or they would be able to earn their freedom or run away to freedom. When I portray Kate Sharper here on site for our Eco Explorers tour, I'm often asked by the students, some parents and sometimes the teachers, why Kate doesn't run away. And there have been recollections in slave narratives where, and even portrayed in other books and in media, where someone has the opportunity to get their freedom, but because they have family members that may either still be on the plantation or maybe at a nearby plantation, and they have the opportunity to see them under whatever circumstances, they may be hesitant to seek their freedom. Some with the mindset of they know where they are, they know where their next meal is coming from. For some, it was just easier for them to stay where they were. Some were perhaps afraid of what was out there for them with freedom. If all you know was pulling tobacco in one place, in one area, and the idea of going across the road and being free, it can be both exciting and fearful. The fear of the unknown, I'm sure held many of them back. In some of the resources that we will be sharing with you all, we will be able to show you a list of inventory that one of the owners in this area had um, listed with the probate records in Prince George's County. And towards the bottom, you can clearly see one Negro sharper. There's another one that says Negro woman, Kate. Listed underneath a frying pan sets of forks and knives and a pot. And the idea that a woman, man, or a child 
is listed in a probate record as part of inventory. Really brings home the point that human beings were not treated like human beings in this country. They were property. And every person that breathes has the right to be respected and seen as a human. And nobody should have ever been listed in an inventory as property. The next slave narrative that I would like to highlight is from the life of Olandu Equiano or Gustavus Vasa, the African. Now, this is an autobiography of a young man who was kidnapped from his own country, which is now Nigeria in Africa, and brought to this land. He was brought to Virginia as an enslaved person. The beginning of chapter three, it says, the author is carried to Virginia. His distress, surprise at seeing a picture and a watch and is bought by Captain Pascal and sets out for England. But this is when he was brought to Virginia. He says, I now totally lost the small remains of comfort I had enjoyed in conversing with my countrymen, the women too, who used to wash and take care of me were all gone different ways and I never saw one of them afterwards. I stayed on this island for a few days. I believe it could not be above a fortnight when I and some few more slaves that were not sellable amongst the rest from very much fretting were shipped off to a sloop for North Africa, North America. On the passage, we were better treated than when we were coming from Africa and we had plenty of rice and fat pork. We landed upon a river a good way from the sea about Virginia County, where we saw a few or none of our native Africans and not one soul who could talk to me. I was a few weeks weeding grass and gathering stones in a plantation. And at last, all my companions were distributed different ways and only myself was left. I was now exceedingly miserable and thought myself worse off than any of the rest of my companions, for they could talk to each other, but I had no person to speak to that I could understand. In this state, I was constantly grieving and pining and wishing for death rather than anything else. While I was in this plantation, the gentleman to whom I supposed the estate belonged being unwell, and I was sent for to his dwelling house to fan him. When I came into the room where I was, I was very, where he was, I was very much affrighted at some things I saw. And the more so as I had seen a black woman slave as I came through the house who was cooking the dinner. And the poor creature was cruelly loaded with various kinds of iron machines. She had one particularly on her head, which locked her mouth so fast that she could scarcely speak and could not eat nor drink. I was much astonished and shocked at this contrivance, which I afterwards learned was called the iron muzzle. Soon after I had a fan put in my hand to fan the gentleman while he slept. And so I did indeed with great fear. While he was fast asleep, I indulged myself a great deal in looking about the room, which to me appeared very fine and curious. The first object that engaged my attention was a watch, which hung on the chimney and was going. I was quite surprised at the noise it made and was afraid it would tell the gentleman anything I might do amiss. And when I immediately after observed a picture hanging in the room, which appeared constantly to look at me, I was still more affrighted having never seen such things as these before. At one time, I thought it was something relative to magic and not seeing it move, I thought it might be some way the whites had to keep their great men when they died 
and offered them libations as we used, used to our friendly spirits. In this state of anxiety, I remained till my master awoke. When I was dismissed out of the room, to my no small satisfaction and relief, for I thought that these people were all made up of wonders. In this place, I was called Jacob, but aboard the African snow, I was called Michael. And that's just a, a small snippet of an autobiography of a man who was born free in his native country on the continent of Africa stolen from his family, separated from his sister, and brought to this foreign land to be enslaved. Um, I am very grateful and happy that I have um, additional support. There are people in the chat who are available to answer questions if you have any in reference to the Akakik Foundation itself. And I also have a fellow staff member who is going to give me questions that you may have that you are welcome to put into the chat. And we ask that you do use the chat for questions so that we can keep things smooth and that everybody is able to be aware of the questions that have been asked in case you have a question somebody else may also have. And again, as a reminder, you, all, you will all be sent an email next week with a copy of this entire presentation to include the video that was shown and resource materials and reference materials if you are interested in doing further research on your own. Does anybody have any questions right now? How was doing Sisters Forever to the family? Um, so the question was, how was it to do Sisters Forever with my family? It was a wonderful opportunity. Um, the young lady who plays Marianne Soul is my daughter, Liana. She is 15. It was, it proved an interesting challenge to make us try to look like sisters because when you tune in to see the reunion of Kate and Jack, in our portrayal, Jack was, born, was sold away when he was 12 years old. And so in our interpretation, he is 17, roughly about to turn 18. And so we needed to make it believable that she was old enough to have been a sister that I would have had a connection with, or that Kate would have had a connection with before coming to this land. So that was, that was an interesting challenge to overcome, but it was a really special opportunity because I started doing historical interpretation when my son started kindergarten. I wanted to be involved with his schooling, but I didn't want to be the mom that sat in the back of the room and watched the class while the teacher went to lunch. And I told his kindergarten teacher that I could dress up as any historical figure and come and tell their story in first person. And she took me up on that. And over 15 years later, here I am now still educating people in first person narrative. And I take the responsibility very seriously to share the stories of those whose stories have been lost to history and to say the names of those who have been forgotten. And so because I started doing historical interpretation to participate in my children's education, it's really, really special to have them old enough and to care enough about the history that they are willing to dress up in full wool, historically accurate costumes on a hot summer day to portray and bring these stories to life and to, to share our history and to honor the ancestors who suffered unspeakable acts of cruelty and inhumane treatment. So thank you for the question, Ricky. It was, it was a wonderful experience and I'm looking forward to continuously filming 
future historical presentations and any other museum theater opportunities that I have with my children. Andrew would like to know, um, what is Kate Sharper's connection to Akakeek? The question is, what is Kate Sharper's connection to Akakeek? Um, we have documentation that Kate Sharper was brought to a farm in this area. We, we believe it's directly on our site, but we don't have any way of knowing exactly which spot in the large acreage that we steward. But in 1751, we know that she was brought as part of a dowry when she was eight years old. And we know that she was listed as part of the probate records. And because she was a real woman, even though she did not do anything that was historically significant to have her included in an encyclopedia or any type of textbook, we want to bring respect to her name. We want to acknowledge that she was a real living, breathing woman. And so we have, we have crafted a story that is historically possible that could have happened to her because we know the same types of stories happen to many, many, many families where they were taken from their families as children. And then as they grew and had children, those children were taken from them and were scattered to various ends of the country. And that is her connection to Akakeek. We want to tell the stories of the people of this area, of this land, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how unpleasant it is, we have to be honest about the history. If we don't learn what has truly happened in the past, we can't see where we are, we can't strive to be better in the future we will be stuck in saying their names and telling the stories of everybody in this area that we have a connection to within the Akakeek Foundation. We find it our responsibility to tell those stories authentically and with as much respect and compassion as we can. Well, my children are not active historical interpreters, but they do volunteer here at the Akakeek Foundation in various capacities to include historical interpretation, specifically dealing with the Sharper family series. What was the second portion of the question? Um, they wanted to just have conversations about the material outside of the show. Thank you. The second portion of the question was, do, they, do we have conversations about the material? Yes, we do. Uh, they all know that Kate Sharper was a real woman. They understand why we have fictional characters that we have created to flesh out the story. I, I try to get their feedback on how they as young people living in the world that they're living in in 2020, how they feel about the history, how they interpret it themselves. What can they bring to the characters? I asked my children very recently, what did they learn about slavery in their schools? My youngest daughter is in middle school, my middle daughter is in high school, and my son is in college. And all three of them said that the most they learned about slavery was what I spoke to them about at home or when I came to their schools dressed as a historical figure. There was information in textbooks, but it wasn't dwelt, it wasn't dwelled on, it wasn't focused on and the teachers and the curriculum did not elaborate on it. And all three of them have actually thanked me for doing what I do and they think I have the best job in the world. But they said that if it had not been for me teaching them, they wouldn't have the awareness to the significance of what is going on now and how much, even though things have changed a lot, how much things have not changed. And so they, they find it I think they find it an interesting opportunity. And anytime I've asked them if they're willing to participate or help me out or come on site, they never hesitate to say yes, even in the hot wool clothing.
Yes, so I believe there's a question about um, an archaeological dig in the Jug Bay area. I do not have any information about that at the moment, but we will research and find out what we can. And we have your email information and whatever we can find as far as resources or other contacts for you to get the answer to your question, we will make sure that you are contacted. Thank you for the question. The question is, what is one of the challenges of researching African American stories from this, this period? One of the challenges is that a lot of it was not written down. The Library of Congress has a, there was a, there was an initiative in the 1930s for them to collect slave narratives from surviving former slaves. In the 1930s, those former slaves would have been in their 80s and 90s. So a lot of the information that we have about what it was like to be a slave and slave narratives specifically, most of them were recorded from the 1800s. By us portraying the 1700s, it makes it a little more difficult because a lot of the autobiographies that have been written, many of those former slaves finished their lives in England. And it's hard to find exactly when they left the American colonies and went to England with their freedom. A lot of it wasn't written down. Most of the autobiographies and slave narratives that I have found have been written from a male perspective. There are a few that have been written from a woman's perspective, but those autobiographies do not cover the 1700s. So that is why we say our story about Kate Sharper is historically plausible or possible because we don't have definitive proof of everything that happened to people that were enslaved in the 1700s. We have more information leading into the 1800s. And often the stories stay the same, just the years change. And we've pulled from those stories from the 1800s as well as the recollections of the autobiographies from the men who have written them that dealt with the 1700s to craft these stories. The question is, if you want to get involved in historical interpretation, what are the steps involved to pursue this at Akakik and other institutions? Number one, have a love for history. I've always been interested in history and the costuming. The, I think the costuming caught my attention, the clothing rather, caught my attention more when I was a child and pulled me back in as an adult. But having a love for history and wanting to share those stories, either in a third person format or dressing as the character themselves or the person themselves in a first person format, you can use a theater background, a public speaking background, a communications background. Having a history background is very, very important, but you don't have to be a history major to be able to be a historical interpreter. You want to have a heart for the people and for the community that you are sharing about, that you are educating about. There is a lot of work 
and research that goes into bringing these characters and these figures to life. You want to be authentic. You want to be relatable. And what people don't talk about when getting involved in a first person historical interpretive field is the emotional turmoil that you can go through while doing the research and preparing to be these characters. I am very thankful for the staff that I work with here at the Akakik Foundation. Being the staff member that portrays an enslaved person, there's only so many times a day where I, as Shamika, can say the words, Welcome to the Bolton Farm. I am Kate Sharper, their slave. Before it starts to kind of pierce your heart a little bit. My fellow interpreters have always been very compassionate with me, very kind to me, very gentle with me because they don't understand what I'm going through, but they know that it can be difficult. Just as I do not understand what they go through when they are faced with portraying a historically based figure that was an enslaver. If you're interested in participating with the Akakik Foundation specifically for historical interpretation, once the restrictions are lifted for our volunteers to be able to come back on staff and be more involved, we do have a segment that I, a segment of the volunteers called the Special and Beyond Era Programming, where you can volunteer your services there. If you are interested, please contact us or contact me at sberry at akakeek.org, and I can give you more information if you want to specifically, if you have specific interest in doing historical interpretation here at Akakeek Foundation. But if you have the background, and the desire to learn more about it, check your local museums. Do the research, contact them, see what volunteer opportunities that they have, or even employment opportunities. There are many, many museums, especially in the DC area, that you can get information from. But even if you are outside of this, this area, just reach out to your local museums and again, my email address is sberry at akakeek.org. And if you email me, I can give you some more personal pointers and ideas on how you can pursue this if this is something you would like to do. The question is, what is my background and did my children attend Prince George's County Schools? My background is that I, when I graduated from college many, many years ago, I actually went into the Air Force and I was an Air Force officer for five and a half years. And I was tired of sitting behind a desk and I wanted to be creative. And I've always been a performer. My mother and my father would call it something different, but I've always been a performer and I've always been drawn to historical television shows and movies. So when I got out of the military, I got involved with my local theater and found a great theater family in this area. But then again, as I said, when my son started kindergarten, I wanted to be involved and just talking to his teacher, I said that I could dress up as a historical figure and that's really what brought me to where I am now. I was going to schools portraying Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks. Throughout February, I was very, very busy. And about five and a half years ago, there was a notice for historical interpreters here at the Akakik Foundation. And I applied part time and started portraying Kate Sharper then. And about a year and a half ago, I became the full-time interpretation coordinator. My children went to Charles County Schools. So they did not go to any of the Prince George's County Schools, but I have done historical interpretation in the past for some Prince George's County Schools. Um, is there any chance of you or others writing a book 
historical or novel on the life of Eunice Shepherd? That's an excellent question. The question is, is there any possibility that I or someone else will write a book about Kate Sharper? That is not in my plans. I don't know if that's in anybody else's plans. We really don't have enough information about her to do an accurate historical portrayal. And the, I do remember that the question asked if there was a possibility for a novel. I don't know. I've never thought about doing a novelization of the story that we've crafted about Kate Sharper, but now the idea is in my head, so who knows? Um, somebody asked, how do we find early slave historical interpretations? So the question is, how do we find other slave historical interpretations? If you are talking about in-person interpretations, I have a very good friend named Brenda Parker who portrays in multiple enslaved women at Mount Vernon, right across the river from us, actually. I don't know of any others personally in this area who do historical interpretation. I have seen a few names in passing, but I've not met them in person. And I do know that Cheney McKnight, who is in New York, is a historical reenactor and has a lot of valuable insight into interpreting people who were enslaved. She has a YouTube channel, I believe, and or a blog. I will verify that and we will include her information in the resources if you would like that. Well, the time is now 12.52, and I would just like to thank you all again so very much for your participation, the wonderful questions that you asked, and for joining us for this special Zoom presentation of Sisters Forever. We appreciate your interest because now that you know about Kate Sharper and know a little bit more about those who were enslaved and what they had to endure, now that you know that there were free Blacks in the 1700s in Maryland, you can go and you can share that with your families and friends who may not have been able to participate in this. We ask that you continue to follow us at the Akakik Foundation page on Facebook, where we will have more information about the upcoming event, the reunion of Kate and Jack on August 6th, that will include the Zoom chat talk back with my son and I. And we do have, our website is being under construction right now and it's gonna come back bigger and better. We're looking for that sometime mid-August. So keep an eye out on that. But thank you all so much for your participation and your support. Be good to each other and continue to educate. Thank you. Thank you.